Hi, this is Guy Wallace. Welcome to my session at LDC, the Learning and Development Conference. My session, you found the performance gaps, now what? This is part one, introduction to the EPI framework. EPI stands for Enterprise Process Performance Improvement. The next four sessions will cover addressing the process itself in number two, addressing the environmental enablers in number three, and addressing the human enablers in number four. These four sessions, these four segments for you found the performance gaps now what will help you drive towards performance beyond instruction but perhaps including instruction. Now a word of warning. Always speak in the language of your customers. Use their language, not yours. Save your jargon for conferences and social media conversations. In what I'm going to show you here, you're probably going to need to or want to change my language and models to better fit your context. So my rule has always been, adopt what you can and adapt the rest. All of this is part of what I call EPI thinking, Enterprise Process Performance Improvement Thinking. We're trying to look at performance-based instruction and beyond that to performance improvement consulting. So let's go. To start, I need to define performance competence. This is how I've been defining it now for about 20 years. Performance competence is the ability to perform tasks, to produce outputs, to stakeholder requirements. And this is true at four levels. It's true at the worker level. It's true at the workflow level. It's true at the workplace level. And it's true at the world level. Now I've adapted Roger Addison's four W's. My definition of performance competence is valid at all four levels. We need society to produce outputs to meet its stakeholder requirements. We need organizations to produce their outputs and meet their stakeholder requirements. We need each process in the enterprise to produce outputs to meet their stakeholder requirements. And we need the individuals involved in the processes and practices of our enterprises to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. Outputs, which are inputs downstream, so to speak, are a function of three sets of variables. Now, this session assumes that you've found a gap in the current state performance, and probably, hopefully, you did that by attending my other session at the LDC conference, Performance Competence and Content Analysis. Now, assumptions are problematic, as we all know. Not that you necessarily have to take that session, but we're going to be talking about things that relate to gaps in performance competence itself in the tasks or outputs when they don't meet stakeholder requirements, but we're going to be looking beyond that immediacy and we're going to be looking at the context, the performance context itself to see if there's gaps in that. So the three areas we're going to be looking at is, is a function of my epi fishbone diagram where we're going to be looking at the process and the environmental enablers and the human enablers, but then we're going to be looking upstream to the provisioning systems inside the enterprise or outside that provision environmental assets to meet the needs of the process, or they provision human assets to meet the needs of the process. We will cover these three EPI models in detail. So first, there's the fishbone diagram. Now this is adapted from the Ishikawa diagram, which comes from Japan in the 1950s as part of their post-World War II quality improvement efforts. And it was also then a mashup with Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model. First of all, we need to look at the process itself. Is it even designed for effectiveness and efficiency in meeting the stakeholder requirements? Yes or no is the answer. So you need to start there. And then you need to ask yourself if there's a gap there, who owns that process gap? Who owns the process? 
Second, we want to look at the environmental enabler provisioning systems. These are systems in the enterprise that aren't often named exactly as I have them configured in blue on the left, but we need to understand who owns the responsibility for those systems that provide enabling assets to the processes. So if we have a gap in the process, it may be due to something upstream, these provisioning system. So this is how I categorize those environmental enablers. Of course, in your organization, they're going to be named and configured differently. So I have a job aid to help you try to determine who owns the process and who owns the provisioning systems in your enterprise. Third, we look at the human enablers of the process. And these are my systems inside the enterprise that we need to look toward if there's a gap in the human aspects of performance and we need to determine who owns these processes and provisioning systems so that we can attend to those. Once you've identified an upstream source of the gap, because you found a gap, now what? Well, you found the source for that and it may be upstream. Could be the process itself, could be the environmental enabling provisioning systems, it could be the human enabler provisioning systems but you're going to apply the same EPI process to them that was covered in that other session that I referenced earlier. And then you're going to need to repeat that effort further upstream if it's one of the enabler provisioning systems enabling provisioning systems. So this is my framework for organizing projects to address enterprise process performance improvement. Stage one is where we uncover the gaps and their upstream causes, and we design a future state, and then we do some implementation planning, perhaps things to happen in certain waves, or maybe all at once, or maybe there are certain things we're gonna forego because the cost of improving them isn't warranted by the value of the problem itself. Just because we can fix things and improve things doesn't mean we should. If it costs $100,000 to fix a $10,000 problem, we probably shouldn't address that. We should just live with it, let it go. In phase three, when you've designed your future state, you're gonna be able to price it out. In phase four, you decide what you really need to do going forward in EPI stage two. That's where you're gonna actually conduct the improvement efforts. This is a typical addy like model, project planning at Kipok on the front, analysis, more detailed analysis than you did in stage one, more detailed design that you did in stage one, now because you know you're really going to be addressing it. Then you're gonna develop and implement the solution or solution set. Then you're gonna pilot test that to make it sure it works before you do a general revision and release. In your optional exercise, you can read about what we cover in, in advance based on my 2006 chapter, Modeling Mastery Performance and Systematically Deriving the Enablers for Performance Improvement. It's a long title and I might have uh, in, uh, titled it instead, Zap the Crap. Your optional exercise walks you through what this session will cover in parts two, three, and four, plus there are some additional readings and references and a separate job aid. In the next session, we're going to cover addressing the process itself. Now that we've overviewed these three things, we're going to talk about addressing the process itself in segment two, in segment three, addressing the environmental enablers, and segment four, addressing the human enablers. Here are some additional optional resources. These are the same for each of the four segments of this session. There's many other blog posts and YouTube videos that are available through my website, and you can find all of that under the resource tab at www.epic.biz. I also have a couple of books on these things as well. Now, part of my methodology involves facilitating groups of master performers and other subject matter experts. I call this process, this methodology, FGP, Facilitated Group Process. I've been doing this in instructional design projects since 1979. 
and I've written a lot about this in several books and here's a set of readings that you can find if you're interested in doing that how to work with teams of people to address enterprise process performance improvement feel free to follow up with me with any questions comments or concerns that you might have you can email directly or coordinate and work with me as part of the LDC conference. Hi, this is Guy Wallace. Welcome to my LDC conference session. You found the performance gaps. Now what? Part two of four parts. In this second part, we're going to address the process itself. Out of the four parts, we did an introduction to the EPI models in segment one. In segment two here, we're going to address the process itself. And after this, in segment three, we'll address the environmental enablers. And in segment four, we will address the human enablers. All of this is intended to help us go for performance. Now, this is the same warning as last time. You may need to adopt what you can and adapt the rest. You may need to change my language and models to better fit your context. Again, performance competence is the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. And this is my Epi Fishbone diagram. It allows me to look at the process itself, the environmental enablers, and the human enablers and that's where I'll find gaps potentially. A lot of my thinking on this goes back to a managing the organizations as systems model of Gary Rumler and Dale Brethauer from the 1960s. Now I came across this model back in the late 70s and early 80s as I was oriented to the approaches to performance based instruction and performance improvement uh, by Dr. Gary Rumler, the late Gary Rumler. So this is key to my process view and orientation. This model uh, on the diagram here is from a late 90s newsletter that uh, Gary gave me this diagram. Um, and if you'll look at this, this is the traditional input process outputs with a couple of changes. It's got a receiving system on the far right. This is key. The receiving system demands an output and then your process produces it. It requires inputs to do so. But there's feedback that come from the process. Now a funny thing, I have a video of Gary from 1981 when he spoke at Motorola uh, the week before I took my official first uh, day on the job at Motorola back in the spring of 1981. And he showed a slide then and he made a comment in the video about how he was missing an aspect to that model. Well, when he saw what I'd published of his in my newsletter in the late 90s, he made the same comment. He had forgotten the consequence system. So the receiving system uh, can send back not only feedback, but consequences. They can cut their orders for your product or order less or just give you negative feedback or refuse to pay you for what you've done, depending on where that receiving system is. If it's outside the organization, that's how that might work. But anyway, so these are the elements of managing organizations as systems. What's really key here is the notion that processes produce outputs that are inputs downstream. Now I've changed the orientation on this diagram here, but from process flows from upstream to downstream, if you will. And again, processes produce outputs that are inputs downstream, so there's a chain of these. And they either meet the stakeholder requirements or they do not. Now over on the right hand side here, I've got three versions of a stakeholder hierarchy. 
This is for illustrative purposes only. Your view may look very different. But at the top of this example sit the shareholders and owners. You can see where the customers exist on this chart and the graphic is intended to suggest that customers lead the definition of requirements but they don't sit at the top of the hierarchy. Management could decide that meeting the customer requirements is a bad business decision, too distracting from the core aspects of the business, or that the financial returns don't warrant that. The board of directors may decide that's not in our best interest to do that. The shareholders might say you're not making as much profit margin or you may be going negative meeting those customer requirements and we shouldn't do that. We should be adding value, not subtracting value. This next version is a little bit more realistic. It doesn't matter what the shareholders and owners want or demand. The government has laws, regulations, codes in place that must be met. So we must comply with those. Now, if we take a social responsibility viewpoint, governments and organizations exist to serve the needs of society. Doesn't always seem that it works that way, but that's a little bit idealistic. And if you've got social responsibility on your agenda at your enterprise, this is probably a more appropriate way to look at this. Now the graphic doesn't include entities such as regulatory uh, groups or unions or whatever you might have uh, as part of your set of stakeholders. Everyone is different and that's why this graphic is labeled for illustrative purposes only. So if stakeholder requirements are set by the stakeholders for the processes, the measures and standards of those requirements usually relate to these four and sometimes a fifth one. Quality, quantity, cost, and schedule. You've heard these before. But you might add safety into the mix. And of course, every enterprise is a little bit different and they might use different language to express these measures. And they might have specific standards for each of these. For cost, they might say it's between a dollar and a dollar two, or German marks, or whatever currency you use. So the idea here is that the process outputs can be measured, the process itself can be measured in terms of these dimensions, these measures, and there could be very specific standards related to each one of these. We need to understand that when we're looking for gaps because if you don't meet the standards of the measures of the processes or outputs that's where you get a gap. Now the language is ch always changing and so what I used to call processes, well I still call processes, it's also known as workflow nowadays. But in parallel with the workflow, the task flow if you will, is a thought flow. So we have overt behavioral tasks that are being performed in the processes and we have covert cognitive tasks being performed. We can see the behaviors, we can even count them, but we can't do that as easily with what people are thinking. And that's something that we need to understand as we're trying to uncover what are the root causes for the symptoms that we see when our outputs or our processes aren't meeting the standards of the measures of our stakeholders. So behaviors and cognition are something that's really key and it's the cognitive part that makes this very tricky. So if you have a process and you understand the flow of the processes and the interchange, the exchange of outputs which are inputs downstream, you can begin to look at well what does the process need to have in place the infrastructure if you will to support that process well in my model my adaptation of the Ishikawa diagram and Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model I look at things with these two extra buckets if I'm not looking at the process himself I'm looking at the assets that enable the processes environmental assets and human assets and these are the various dimensions of those now another way of looking at the process itself is using a device I call a performance model. And here's a made up example for the logging company and the area of performance or major duty or key results area or accomplishment is thinning the forest. 
There are certain outputs and there are certain measures for those outputs. Associated with the output is a set of tasks, the key tasks, macro tasks, mid-level tasks, micro tasks, depending on what your need is downstream for yourself as to how much detail you would generate at this particular stage. Then we can define the roles and responsibilities as to who does what. We can just simply access who's involved in a particular task or we can use RACI or other uh, mechanisms, coding devices to establish you know, who's doing what. I usually use something that's uh, E for execute, S for support the execution, I for give input to the process of the execution, R for reviewing and giving feedback, and A for approving or rejecting the tasks and or the outputs. So there's different ways to categorize roles and responsibilities, but this is the device I use to capture that from master performers and other subject matter experts to define ideal performance. On the right hand side of that are typical performance gaps and the probable gap causes. If we're not producing outputs that meet those measures, there's a gap. What are those typical performance gaps? Now, I could be looking for every last gap under the sun for the history of the company, but normally I'm looking for what's typical. What are the prevalent issues uh, related to the performance here? And I call those the typical performance gaps. And then I want to know, well, what are some of the causes of the gaps? So I ask one of the master performers and subject matter experts that I'm working with, and they will tell me. And then I can attribute each one of those gaps to a certain type. You'll see down on the bottom right there, there's four different types. A deficiency of the process itself, a deficiency of the environmental enablers. I mean, if my saws are dull, as this first probable gap cause says, well, that's an environmental enabler. It's got very little to do with the deficiency of the knowledge and skills of an individual or a deficiency of their individual attributes and values. Now, if you look over on the right there, the human assets has awareness, knowledge, and skills. This is what the human brings to the performance party. But they also bring their physical attributes, their stamina, their strength, their sight, their hearing capabilities. But they, and they, they bring psychological attributes, their, their willingness to persevere in a difficult situation, their willingness to take rejection and making a whole bunch of sales calls without making a sale, etc. There's intellectual attributes as well that they bring. Either they're conceptual thinkers or concrete thinkers, or they can do both. And perhaps that's what the process requires, is a conceptual thinker that can also think quite concretely. But then they also bring personal values. And either all of those are conducive and meet the needs of the processes, or they do not. The same thing with the environmental asset enablers. There's data information, there's materials and supplies, there's tools and equipment, facilities and grounds, budget and headcount, culture and consequences. Either the environment, the performance context, is conducive to the humans involved to produce the outputs, or they are not. On the left, on the performance model, that's what I call ideal performance. If I'm working with master performers who perform at a level of mastery, the goal is usually to get everybody else to perform at those levels or as close as possible to the levels of the master performers. And then on the right hand side are the gaps. So this is the gap performance or a gap analysis and that's captured all on one page uh, against the ideal performance so we can compare them back and forth. This is what was covered in my other session at LDC. So perhaps you may want to take that or take it later or skip it because you know enough about all of this already. The enablers of process performance are critical. So when we look at what are the gaps in the outputs that we produce or the gaps in the tasks that are being performed, we can attribute those to certain causes. And those are my four categories. You may need to change them. As I've said before, adopt what you can, adapt the rest. But this is how then I look at, well, what, what are the gaps caused by? Now I can take a set of performance models on the bottom right there and roll them up to look at a particular part of the organization. And my model on the left there is, this is how I frame 
looking at the areas of performance, they could have been called major duties, they could have been called accomplishments, they could have been called key results areas, but I can look at an entire department which is a composition of processes. And this is my way of segmenting all of those processes. And I can look at the leadership processes. Now, in the leadership processes, there are operational planning and management. And inside that would be budgeting. Well, budgeting is controlled by the finance organization in most places. And everybody's going to do budgeting the way they tell you it needs to be done. So the leadership processes are not owned, typically, by a department. They are working in somebody else's processes, and they don't get to change them. They don't get to do them differently without running into whatever that might cause in the organization. The same thing with those things on the bottom there, the support processes in that frame, uh, process redesign and human asset management and environmental asset management and special assignments. When people in a department are working on those, they're usually working in somebody else's process. In the human asset management is the hiring and firing and the compensation and all of that that go along with HR, human resources kinds of things. And departments have to play in those processes and, and conform and conf uh, to those process requirements. And the things that are unique to a department that makes one department different from the rest are the core processes, which are on the bottom there, at, and the blue and the green. And in the middle of the diagram, there's a core set where we're planning work, assigning work, monitoring work, and troubleshooting work of the individual contributors and ourselves, if you were management, looking at the processes that makes sales a sales organization versus finance the finance organization versus L&D, which does L&D kinds of things. L&D still has to do a budget. Sales has to do a budget. Even finance departments and organizations have to do budgets. And they are actually working in somebody else's process. So this is my way to look at processes similar, uh, shared across an enterprise, and then to look in zero in on those that are unique to an organizational entity, a department or a team or a function or a division inside a larger enterprise that's more complex. But that's how I roll all these performance models up into one big picture, just like you'd roll up the budgets from one process into the department level, into the functional level, into the enterprise level. So I also dissect the processes of a department this way. And I use my LCS, Leadership, Core and Support Processes, as a way to frame them so that I understand what's shareable and what's unique to a department compared to all the other departments or functions across an enterprise. So at an enterprise level, when I think about the organization chart, I think about it this way. So again, you can roll these up from the right to the left, and you can roll them down and dissect them from the left to the right. Processes produce outputs that are inputs downstream. Gaps are found in these processes or the outputs when they don't meet the stakeholder requirements. Once you've identified the upstream source of a gap, if you've looked at the provisioning systems that we talked about in the last segment, and we'll talk again in segments three and four, you're really repeating this epi process, analyzing it to look at the outputs from HR or from uh, the materials uh, organization to make sure if there's an issue with our process, the target that we're looking at, and we're not getting the materials, and we're not getting people who know what they're doing, they're not trained well enough, we need to look upstream at those enabling systems to see what's going on with them. And so we're repeating the same analysis methodology and we're looking at their processes and their outputs, which are inputs to our target process, which we've deemed deficient, or we think that they're deficient, and we're trying to understand why. All of this fits back into a project planning and management framework, Epi Stage 1 and Epi Stage 2. In Epi Stage 1, we're targeting 
the EPI efforts. We do project planning and kickoff. We analyze the current state to find the gaps. We design a future state where we take away those gaps. And when we do implementation planning, we may be prioritizing all the solutions that we could put in place. And from a Pareto uh, perspective, we may be putting and addressing only 80% of our issues by addressing 20% of the opportunities to invest money in solutions. We don't have to do everything. We have to do the things that uh, provide a bigger bang for the buck. That's the planning. That planning then is a high level planning that will lead to more planning in stage two where we do detailed project planning for the various work streams. We do more detailed analysis, more detailed design, and then we develop or acquire our solution set and then we pilot test it. If we had to change software tools and policies and procedures and training for people, we need to make sure that all three of those solution sets work together to get the job done. Once we're assured of that or we make revisions after our pilot test, we release it for general use. We implement the improvement across the board or to whatever extent was necessary. One of the issues about looking at processes is trying to figure out who owns the responsibility for the process or processes. Now, a big issue is that processes, unless they're the big processes of our enterprise, they're informal. They're not formal. They're hardly named or measured or managed. They just happen. People take care of them, but it's not a formal approach to this. It's rather ad hoc. So that's one of the issues is figuring out, well, who owns the process? because that's what we're focused on in this segment. So finding that, who owns this process and who can speak to what's really important, what are the key measures, who are the stakeholders that we're trying to serve with the outputs that are produced, and who cares about the process itself? Are there regulators that care about how we go about doing our business? They may not care about the outputs, they may care about the outputs, but there are stakeholders who care about the process itself and there's other stakeholders who care about the output. And we need to figure that out. And so there's a process owner or several owners in our enterprise, and we're going to need to figure out who are they. Now, when I'm doing this kind of work, I try to work with a facilitated group process with master performers and other subject matter experts uh, to because they generally know. They know who the stakeholders are. They know who's service, they know where the feedback comes from, they know what kind of consequences there are for doing something well or not, and so I like to work with a group of people because it goes much quicker. If you can't bring a group of people together, you have to work with them one-on-one, -on -one, and they're going to give you varied inputs, and they may call some things uh, Missouri, and other people call it Missouri, and you're not sure if it's the same thing or not, and there's all this language issues, and because processes are rather informal, they may not be named the same way across the enterprise. When you bring a group of master performers together, you, they can usually figure that out. Now, it's not a slam dunk and it's not really quick, but they need to talk it out to decide that they're talking about the same thing or something different. Um, and this is just the nature of that beast. So they can help define the processes and they can then help you understand where the gaps are and who owns the information and data systems or who does organization and job redesign, if anybody, or is that left to the process owner? So these are the things that the uh, facilitate group process can help you do uh, with the right people to do the right things at the right times. Now there's an optional exercise. You can read ahead about what we're going to be covering in the next couple of sessions in that because there's just one handout. And this is based on my 2006 chapter in the Human Performance Technology Handbook uh, of uh, the third edition of that. And my, the title of my chapter was Modeling Mastery Performance and Systematically Deriving the Enablers for Performance Improvement. A mouthful, right? Yeah, I could have called it Zap the Crap because that's really what it's all about. So there's a handout that gives you some readings and it'll guide you into doing uh, an optional exercise uh, that you might find of interest. So this exercise will walk you through looking at your own situation, a situation that you're familiar with from the past or something that you're working on currently, and trying to determine 
what you can about the process. Are there issues with the process itself and who owns that process? In the next session, we'll carry forward to thou start to look at the first of the two enabler provisioning system. We'll look at who provides the environmental enablers. And after that, we'll wrap this up by looking at who affects who provides the human enablers that the process requires. There's some more additional and optional resources. There's readings, uh, there's blog posts, there's YouTube videos. These are pretty much the same uh, in each of these four segments. I have a book on uh, from training to performance improvement consulting from 2011. And I have another more recent book, Conducting Performance-Based Instructional Analysis, where part of what you're doing during instructional analysis is to determine whether or not the need is really from a def deficit of knowledge and skills or whether it's some of these other enablers that are deficient. This is all part of what I call EPI thinking, enterprise process performance improvement and how to think about that. Feel free to follow up with me with any questions, comments, or concerns. Hi, this is Guy Wallace. Welcome to part three in my LDC session, You Found the Performance Gaps, Now What? Part three of four parts. In this segment, we're going to talk about addressing the environmental enablers and their provisioning systems. Of the four parts here, we've talked about an introduction to the EPI models and this whole set that we're looking at. The process itself, which we covered in the last segment, number two. In this segment, number three, we're covering the environmental enablers. And in the next segment, four, we're going to address the human enablers and their provisioning systems. Again, you're going to need to, or want to, adopt what you can and adapt the rest. Feel free to change the language and models that I'm sharing that will better fit your performance context. Again, performance competence is the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs that meet stakeholder requirements. We're using my Epi Fishbone diagram to focus on the process itself, the environmental enablers, and then the human enablers. You've seen these before. These are the six sets of environmental enablers. Now your organization isn't going to have organizations that look just like this, that are configured this way, um, that are named this way, but that's what you're going to need to look for. Who owns these various systems that are providing enablers to the process that we were targeted on in the first place? So there's various information and data systems, and this is beyond IT. There may be groups that are producing uh, standard operating procedures or policies and procedures and practices and have um, various sources. They could be inside your enterprise. There could be a broker inside your enterprise that's gathering uh, data and information from the outside. This can it, So when you look at a specific process and you're to trying to determine what are the information requirements and what are the data requirements, where do those come from? And so that's not easy to find necessarily, but again, if you're working with master performers and other subject matter experts, they generally know and they can tell you rather than you searching and looking, uh, it's much easier to go uh, to those kinds of people and ask them individually or even better yet as a team. You also need to look for who owns the materials and supply systems that provision or feed the process that we were targeted on. So there's all sorts of various materials and supplies, the consumables, if you will, that the process incorporates into the final product or is just an ancillary set of materials and supplies 
that are necessary that the process itself oil for the machinery that doesn't go into the final product etc etc then there's tools and equipment and machinery this could be vehicles uh, forklift trucks um, all sorts of tools and equipment that are again part of the infrastructure of the process um, we could also look at the budget and headcount do we have sufficient funds to buy the materials and supplies that are necessary to buy the information that's necessary do we have enough headcount do we have budget if we have a, a seasonal fluctuation in our volume and we need to bring in more people do we have a budget for that well yes or no is the answer uh, do we need a clean room as in terms of facilities? Do we need extra parking for our people or our customers or visitors? What kinds of facilities and grounds are required? Um, do we have to have air conditioned? Do we have to have zero dust clean rooms? You know, so there's a lot that we need to look at. And again, it's all driven by the specifics of our targeted process. The last thing and a very important thing is well, what are the consequence systems that are in place that our culture has? What is tolerated? What is not tolerated? What is demanded and expected? What's um, uh, required, but then nobody does anything about it if it's not adhered to? So we also have to look at the if the consequence system in place is adequate to the needs of the process, or does it fight the needs of the process in some manner? Now, when we look at our processes on the right, these are being provisioned with various environmental assets. Again, change the wording, change the configuration as you need to for your organization. But our eye is on the process itself and the outputs from one process to the next, those outputs that are inputs. And these provisioning systems are providing our processes with what they need, or they are not. If there are gaps in what the process needs, you're going to need to figuratively swim back upstream to these provisioning systems to take a look at them. So for example, the information and data systems. Is there a gap indicating a lack of accurate and complete and appropriate and timely information and data? Is the process that provisions this is it uh, adequate always or sometimes or rarely or never? Are there any issues with high costs or medium? Or, so what are the issues for that information and data system and why aren't they meeting our requirements? Who owns responsibility for this? Is that ownership centralized? Only one group or person owns the responsibility for that? Or is it decentralized? There's a lot of different sources for information and data, a lot of different owners. Is some of this shared with the department that owns the process that we're focused on? Again, you're gonna to have to swim upstream from the process and do a deep dive to determine these answers. Start with the process management and with information technology is that's usually prevalent but be aware there are other sources for data and information other than the IT group. If we're looking at materials and supplies again we're looking to see is what we is what the process getting accurate complete appropriate and timely or not. Um, is that adequate all the time or never or in between. Are there issues with cost who owns this responsibility? Is it centralized, decentralized, or shared? Is the processes that they have in the materials and supply world, is that informal? Is it formal? Is it mixed? They may have their own issues and need to address them and formalize some of their processes that are not quite in control well enough. We're going to, have to do the same thing with the tools and equipment systems. Sometimes the process itself owns their own tools and equipment. Sometimes it's maintained by other people, other organizational entities. So we need to look at is this adequate, accurate, complete, and appropriate? And if it's not, is, is the adequacy, is it a rare thing or is it always or what? And what are the issues with costs? Who owns this responsibility? Is it shared or is only one entity own that responsibility, which would make it easy 
but it's not always easy. It's not always centralized to one group. Again, you're going to have to swim upstream and do a deep dive looking at all the sources for tools and equipment. Budget and headcount. Again, if there's gaps and issues indicating that it's a lack of accurate, complete, appropriate, and timely budget and headcount, we've got to look at, well, what are the provisioning systems? Um, and is this adequacy or inadequacy always, sometimes, rare, or never? And what are the cost implications of this? Is this a high cost area, a medium cost, low cost, or zero cost? Who owns the responsibility for this? Centralized or shared or in between? Is it formal, informal, or is there a mix? The facilities and grounds that the processes operate within. Is this adequate or not? Is what they have accurate, complete, appropriate, and timely? Or are there inadequacies in that? And is that always or never or sometimes? Again, these are decisions that you have to decide at the process itself. What are the issues regarding cost related to this? Is this a high cost issue? Solving it is going to cost a lot? Or is it going to be low cost or no cost? Again, once you determine who owns the responsibility for this, is it centralized, which would make it easier to work with them, or is it decentralized and there's a lot of different organizational entities and a lot of different people that you're going to have to work with? Is it shared with the owner of the process? And is that ownership and who owns exactly what an issue because that's not clear to anybody? Again, swimming upstream to look at the process of the provisioning systems and do a deep dive to determine the answers. There's a culture and consequence system in place. It may be ideal, it may not be. But if there's a lack of accurate, complete, and appropriate consequences and timely consequences, you have to look at, well, who owns that? Is it the process itself or is it some other group? Uh, is it adequate always or never or something in between? Is the resolution of this something that's high cost or low cost or what? Who owns responsibility for the culture and consequences? And is that centralized or decentralized? Is it formal or is it informal or is it a mix? Once you've identified the upstream sources for the gaps, well then what? Well, you apply the EPI process to them just as you did on the targeted process. You look at their outputs and determine whether or not it's their process that's deficient or their enabling provisioning systems that are causing them to produce outputs that are inadequate. They're untimely, they don't have the quality, they don't have the cost, etc. So we're just repeating the same analytic process to the upstream sources as we did to our target process in the first place. This is all part of stage one where we've done project planning, we've analyzed the current state. Once we understand what the gaps are, we can design the future state and then we can do some implementation planning. Either we're going to put several solution sets in place all at once or we're going to stage them in the right sequence and that's the plan. But then we would drop down to EPI stage two where we're going to have to do more detailed project and planning for the various work streams, assuming there's more than one solution set. And we're going to have to do more detailed analysis and design and development and acquisition of those. And then we're going to have to pilot test to make sure that they all work together in harmony. And then we can revise whatever needs to be revised and we can release it and implement our solution set or sets as appropriate to the need uh, at, per the plan. Tracking down who owns the responsibility for provisioning what the process needs is sometimes a game of hide and seek. It's not always clear. Um, sometimes people think that they know, but they are not correct because it's not always visible to them where the enablers come from exactly and who owns responsibility for that. 
That's why talking with a group of people, a team of master performers and subject matter experts, including those people from the process itself and some of the likely candidates for provisioning system source issues such as human resources or for the finance organization or materials and supplies is just a couple of examples. Um, we need to engage them to figure out who owns the responsibility. Uh, perhaps they don't even know that they're missing the boat, so to speak, in providing the processes what's needed. Again, working with a group of master performers and other subject matter experts is the quickest route to determining what the process is, what the enablers need to be, and where the current state gaps are. There's an optional exercise. You can read all about that and read ahead. And this is based on uh, my 2006 chapter in the HPT handbook uh, produced by ISPI. You can look ahead at that and there's an optional exercise besides those readings that will walk you through determining you know, who owns the responsibility for environmental enablers in a project that you've had in the past or one that you're dealing with currently. In the next session, we'll wrap up this uh, session entirely and address the human enablers for enterprise process performance improvements. There are additional and optional readings that you might look at. These are the same as presented last time. And there are blog posts and YouTube videos that I have available on my website. There's my 2011 book and my more recent book from last year, 2020. This is all part of what I call Epi Thinking, Enterprise Process Performance Improvement. Uh, we're looking from performance-based instruction through to performance improvement consulting. Feel free to follow up with me with any questions, comments, or concerns that you may have. Hi, this is Guy Wallace. Welcome to part four of my session, You Found the Performance Gaps, Now What? Part of the Learning and Development Conference. In this segment, which wraps up the session, we're going to address the human enablers and their provisioning systems. Our four sessions segments covered introduction to the EPI models, addressing the process itself, addressing the environmental enablers, and now addressing the human enablers. This will enable us to go for performance, performance improvement. Again, you'll need to adopt what you can and adapt the rest. Much of my language and models might need to be changed to fit your context to speak in the language of your customers. Save your jargon, my jargon, for your conferences and social media conversations. Don't talk with your customer about it this way. Find out how they talk about similar things and adapt yourself to their context and language. This is all about performance competence, the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. We're using my epi fishbone diagram so that we could focus on the process itself, the environmental assets that enable the process, and the human assets that enable the process. These human enablers, awareness, knowledge, and skills, physical attributes, psychological attributes, intellectual attributes, and personal values are what the humans bring to the process. You're not going to find organizations designed and configured and named exactly like this, but this is a little bit closer than what you'll find when you're looking at those environmental enablers and their provisioning systems. So you might actually find departments that are named 
close to what I've got here on the right. When we're looking at awareness, knowledge, and skills, there's two primary sources for acquiring those. We can recruit and select people that have them at the, from the very beginning, either from outside our enterprise or inside our enterprise. And we can do training and development or learning and development or learning experience design, etc., to give them the awareness, knowledge, and skills that they need to participate in the process competently. When we look at physical attributes, we're best off hiring for those in the first place. So our recruiting and selection should deal with the stamina issues, the eyesight, the hearing, etc. All of the physical things that somebody needs to have in order to adequately perform in the process. Now we can also organize our jobs, design the jobs in such a way so that we can minimize everybody needing to have certain attributes here if they're difficult to find in the marketplace where we operate. We can uh, align our staffing and succession planning systems to channel people that have these physical attributes into the next series of jobs and minimize our need to do recruiting and selection. Same thing with our psychological attributes. We're better off recruiting the people that have the right psychological dispositions to, the needs, to meet the needs of the process. But we can also organize the, our, our departments, our jobs, etc., in such a way that we minimize the need for everybody to be exactly alike. We can have people who are going to play special roles when they have special needs such as psychological attributes. Same thing with our intellectual attributes. We can recruit and select for those, or we can change the jobs and redesign them uh, to minimize uh, that if it's difficult to acquire that in our marketplace. Personal values, we need to hire the people that have the right personal values. We shouldn't try to train peoples and change their personal values unless there's just no other option. We can again organize ourselves and redesign jobs to minimize uh, certain values so that uh, we're not requiring everybody to have the same thing if it's a difficult thing to find in the marketplaces where we work. We might also use our performance appraisal and management system to shape people's exhibition of their personal values, their behaviors on the job. We may not be able to change their attitudes, but we ought to be able to change behaviors that are inconducive to the needs of the process. The provisioning systems provide the processes with what they need, or they do not. If there are gaps in what the process needs, we need to swim, figuratively, upstream to those sources to find out why they aren't meeting the needs of the process. We can look at the organization and job design systems. Uh, are these adequate to what the process needs? Uh, is it always or sometimes or rarely or never? Are there issues with cost with uh, meeting the needs of the process? Who owns responsibility for this? Is it centralized where there's some group inside the enterprise that does all organization and job design and redesign? Or is it decentralized and lots of people are doing it? Or is it shared? Generally this might be shared between HR and the process owners themselves. Uh, but HR may have certain requirements, uh, constraints that they place on that from uh, for various reasons. It's uh, compensation issues generally, um, but that needs to be taken a look at specifically. Again, you're going to have to swim upstream from your process that you're targeting to do a deep dive in this enabling provisioning system. Staffing succession and planning systems, either they're adequate to the needs of the process or they're not. Either we're growing our own, so to speak, and have a plan for how we're going to meet the needs of our organization internally, or it's a combination of meeting the needs with internal resources, people, and having development and growth paths for them, or we're going to have to hire from the outside, which then works with 
the next system we'll talk about in a minute. Who owns this? Is this is it owned? Is it formal? Is it informal? Etc. Again, we're going to have to swim upstream, but we'll probably have to start with human resources to find out who is doing this and why is it not adequate to the needs of the process. The recruiting and selection system normally work hand in hand with the staffing and selection uh, systems. The recruiting and selection system generally works hand in hand with the staffing and succession systems and carries that out. Uh, recruiting from internal and external sources and making the best selection of the people to meet the needs of the process but also sometimes consistent with where that job may go to so we can grow our own and meet our own needs internally. Is the system adequate to the needs of the process? Is it a shared responsibility or is it centralized or decentralized? Training and development or learning and development or learning experience design or instructional systems design or instructional technology, the department that provides the training and development that people need to master their jobs, is that adequate to the needs of the process? Either we're meeting that need or we are not. Who owns responsibility for that? Is it shared with the process expected to do this or is there a centralized uh, training or learning organization that, that handles that? Again, you're going to have to swim upstream to determine what the answers are in your own organization. Performance appraisal and performance management systems. Are they helping to meet the needs of the process or are they inadequate? Are they adequate or inadequate always or sometimes or rarely or never? What are the cost implications of addressing this? Who owns responsibility for this? Is it shared with the process owners and management and supervision within the process and some other centralized group, such as human resources? You'll need to swim upstream to find out the specifics of that to determine how it needs to be re-engineered to meet the needs of our targeted process. Compensation and benefits. Are we losing people because we don't pay well enough or other organizations in our marketplaces have better benefits packages so if we're losing people skilled people it may be due to compensation and benefits well who owns that process is it adequate to our needs is it being mismanaged are there cost issues with that and who owns the responsibility for it is it centralized or decentralized is it formal informal is it a mix um, you're, again, you're going to have to swim upstream to determine that. And then there's the less formal, but sometimes formal, reward and recognition systems. Is that adequate to the needs of our processes and the people within them? Um, is it always inadequate or sometimes or rarely or never? What are the cost issues associated with this? Who owns responsibility for this? Is this centralized to the process itself? Is it decentralized or is it shared with other organizations? How formal or informal or mixed is it? Once you've identified the upstream sources of the gaps in your targeted process, then what? Well, you're going to pro apply the EPI process to determine what are their processes and outputs, what are their enabling provisioning systems for environmental assets and human assets? What's the root cause for them not meeting the needs of our originally targeted process? We're all dealing here with stage one, targeting the EPI effort, project planning and kickoff, analyzing the current state. Once we've analyzed that current state and understand where our sources are the causes for our gaps, we can design a future state. We can then do implementation planning to decide how we're going to put the new future state in place. And then there's one or more work streams at stage two where we're going to do more detailed project planning, we're going to do more detailed analysis, more detailed design, we're going to develop our own or buy something or a mix of the two. 
and then we're going to pilot test it to make sure that if there's more than one solution set that they all integrate well and work in harmony and then we will do whatever revisions post pilot are necessary and we'll release that and implement the improvement across the board or wherever it was targeted to go. Tracking down who owns the responsibility in these human asset enabler provisioning systems is a little bit easier than in the environmental asset provisioning systems but sometimes it's a game of hide and seek and to find out who's really responsible. You might think it's some group in HR, but you might find out that no, they aren't responsible or they don't feel that they are responsible or should be responsible. They may think it's the responsibility of the process owners themselves. And maybe the process owners think likewise. It's not their responsibility, it's the responsibility of HR. You may uncover the gap here and that the responsibility for addressing some of these things isn't formally assigned. Working with a group of master performers and other subject matter experts is the quickest route to determining what the process is, what it requires, what enablers are required, where the gaps are, and how to resolve them, who owns the responsibility. So they can point you to the organizational entities in your enterprise that address these environmental assets, and the human assets. There's an optional exercise that you can use similar to the one in, that you've previously uh, done in the prior segments and there's this optional exercise where you can apply this to something that you've done in the past or a current state effort. I have additional optional resources. These are the same that was presented before. Uh, I have blog posts and YouTube videos that you can search for on my website. I have my 2011 book from Training to Performance Improvement Consulting. This addresses these EPI models. And I have a more recent book from 2020 about conducting performance-based instructional analysis but looking beyond just the knowledge and skill requirements and looking at if there are problems with the performance, maybe they aren't rooted in a deficit of knowledge and skills and we can help our clients by understanding where the root causes for their problems lie. This is all part of what I call EPI thinking, Enterprise Process Performance Improvement, where we're moving from performance-based instruction and addressing that to perhaps beyond that performance improvement consulting, where the root cause is not due to a deficit of knowledge and skills. Feel free to follow up with me with any questions, comments, and concerns through the course of the conference or follow up with me afterwards. That concludes our four segments, our four sessions, Introduction to the EPI Models, Addressing the Process Itself, Addressing the Environmental Enablers, and Addressing the Human Enablers. All three are critical to meeting the needs of the downstream customer, the process itself, the environmental assets that enable that process, and the human assets that also work in hand in hand with the environmental assets within the process to produce outputs that meet stakeholder requirements. Go for performance. <laughs>